this chapter, we're going to look how cells are going to regulate gene expression. Cells have thousands of genes, but not all of them are turned on at any given time. So in here is how we're going to study how do they know which ones they're going to turn on and off. It is a little bit different in bacterial cells and eukaryotic cells. We're going to start out looking at bacterial cells. We know that they often respond to environmental changes by regulating their transcription. It only makes sense that bacteria wants to conserve resources and energy, so it's only going to express the genes that it needs to at any given time. The way that bacterial cells do this is through operons. These provide a mechanism to control gene expression. In an operon, you've got several functionally related genes that are controlled by a single on and off switch. It's like going into a room and having multiple lights be turned on and off by using just one switch by the door. So these genes are going to be coordinately controlled and served by a single promoter. The operator is going to be the segment of DNA that acts as a switch, and it can be positioned within the promoter or between the promoter and the genes. It will end up controlling access of the RNA polymerase to the genes. Your operon is going to be the whole unit together, the operator, promoter, and the genes they control. The repressor is going to be a protein that binds the operator. This will block the attachment of the RNA polymerase to the promoter, therefore preventing transcription. Your regulatory gene is going to create the repressor. It's generally located some distance away from the operon. And it will be expressed continuously at a low rate in the tryptophan operon. The repressor is an allosteric protein with active and inactive shapes. Your co-repressor is a small molecule that's going to cooperate with the repressor, and it will work to switch off the operon. When you look at this picture here, it does make it seem rather complex. What you have here is tryptophan that's going to act as a co-repressor. When it binds to this active repressor protein, it is going to prevent the RNA polymerase from attaching, and you will have no RNA made. So therefore, it will shut down the gene. When it's not on there, you have an inactive repressor, and it's going to allow the RNA polymerase to attach to the promoter, and therefore transcribe the genes. A repressible operon has transcription usually on, but it can be inhibited by a specific small molecule. In the case of the tryptophan operon, tryptophan is going to act as that molecule. There's a link to a video here on DNA tube that I strongly recommend you watch. I do not play them inside of the videos that I record. It prevents them from staying on YouTube. They'll pull them down for copyright issues. So I encourage you to watch that video on your own. An inducible operon is usually off, but it can be stimulated when a small specific molecule interacts with the regular, regulatory protein. So this is what you're going to have in the LAC operon. When you look at this here, what's going to happen is when lactose is absent, this repressor is going to be active, and it's going to shut off the operon by preventing the RNA polymerase from attaching. When lactose is present, it will act as an inducer, and it will inactivate the repressor, which will allow the RNA polymerase to come on and bind to the promoter and transcribe the genes. So the inducer will inactivate the repressor in the LAC operon. Inducible enzymes are going to include the enzymes of the lactose pathway. Synthesis is induced by a chemical signal. So with repressible enzymes, you generally are going to have them function in anabolic pathways like the tryptophan pathway. They synthesize products, but they will suspend their production when it's already present is a way to conserve energy. The cell's not going to make something that it can easily get from the environment. Negative control genes are going to be operons that switch off by active forms of the repressor protein. Positive control genes are going to be when a regulatory protein interacts directly with the genome to switch transcription on. Here we can have positive gene regulation. So when glucose and lactose are both present, E. coli would preferentially use the glucose and it will regulate this with allosteric regulation. Cyclic AMP will accumulate when glucose is scarce. The CAP, or catabolic activator protein, is an activator that's going to bind the DNA and stimulate transcription. Cyclic AMP 
binds the regulatory protein, CAP takes the active shape and attaches upstream of the LAC promoter and increases the affinity for the RNA polymerase to the promoter and increases transcription. So this is a way of ensuring that it will use glucose when it can, it will use lactose when it has to, and it's not going to make any of the genes for lactose if it isn't present. Eukaryotic gene expression gets regulated at a lot of different stages. When we talk about differential gene expression, this is the expression of different genes by cells with the same genome. In a human, you may only express about 20% of a protein coding genes at any given time. We have so many different specialized cells, there's a lot of genes in them that they don't actually need to use. You may even see less than this in specialized cells. So one way of doing this in eukaryotic cells is to regulate the chromatin structure. This can be done by histone modification. Histone acetylation is going to take acetyl groups and attach them to lysines in the histone tails. The positive charges are neutralized and it changes the shape. This allows the transcription proteins to have easier access to the genes, so it prevents it from winding up as much. Methyl and phosphate groups can also change the shape of the chromatin. The histone code hypothesis proposes that it's specific combinations of modifications, as well as the order in which they occur, that will help determine your chromatin's configuration, and that in turn influences what is transcribed. Another way of modifying the chromatin is DNA methylation. Certain bases in the DNA itself become methylated. This happens in most plants, animals, and fungi. In general, the more methylated the regions are, the less active. Methylation patterns can actually be passed on to successive cell divisions, which would account for genomic imprinting in mammals. Epigenic inheritance is going to be the inheritance of traits that are transmitted by mechanisms not directly involving the nucleotide sequence. This is a reversible modification of the chromatin, and this can explain why you can have identical twins and have one get a genetic disease and the other one does not, despite the fact that they do have identical genomes. Another way of regulating genes is to regulate transcription initiation. The control elements are going to be segments of non-coding DNA that serves as binding sites for the transcription factors, and this regulates transcription in the eukaryotes. So when we look at these transcription factors, we've got general transcription factors that are essential for transcription of all protein coding genes. These tend to have a low rate of initiation, where the specific transcription factors have high levels of transcription of particular genes at appropriate times and place. So these will depend on the interaction of the control elements with other proteins. Proximal control elements are located close to the promoter. Your enhancers or distal control elements are further upstream or downstream from the gene or intron. You can have multiple enhancers to control one gene. One way of doing this is changing the shape of the DNA. We call it protein-mediated bending of DNA. This is thought to bring bound activators into contact with the mediator proteins. So the piece of DNA will actually have all the things together, and by folding it, you have these interactions that help to assemble your initiation complex on the promoter. Here is an example of the DNA where you've got your enhancers, activators, distal control elements that are going to fold bringing in, you'll bring in your mediator proteins being these transcription factors, and eventually you have all of these things come together to form your transcription initiation complex. With silencing, you have some repressors that will recruit proteins that will actually deacetylate the histones to reduce transcription. We tend to use combinatorial control of gene activation there's a limited number of completely different nucleotide sequences in the control elements. It's a relatively small number. So instead, we're going to use a combination of control elements and an enhancer rather than just a single element. This is the equivalent of having to make more complex passwords. If you have a four-digit password and all you're using are numbers, there's going to be a limited combination of passwords that you can come up with. But when you start including in 
letters, numbers, symbols on the keyboard. That greatly increases the combinations for control of your password. So same thing here with the cell. By having a bigger combination of control elements, you can have better regulation. We can have coordinately controlled genes in eukaryotes. These would be groups of genes that function together in prokaryotes, similar to what the operons do in prokaryotes. But in eukaryotes, they aren't located close together. So instead, they're going to depend on an association of the combination of control elements with all the related genes that are located over different chromosomes. This is an example here where you can have a crystalline gene in the liver cell nucleus. When you have these available activators, the crystalline gene is not expressed. In the lens, when you have these available activators, the crystalline gene can be expressed. The nuclear architecture and gene expression, they used to view the nuclear contents as being random in the organization, that they were just basically shoved into the nucleus, but now it does appear that there's a defined architecture. You'll have certain regions that are like transcription factories that are going to have greater amounts of RNA polymerase and the transcription-associated proteins. So then we can have post-transcriptional regulation starting with RNA processing. There's several opportunities for regulation while exporting the RNA. One way is alternative RNA splicing. Here you can have different mRNA molecules that get produced from the same primary transcript depending on which segments you use as introns or exons. And this is controlled by regulatory proteins. So for example here, you've got exons 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in your primary transcript. With alternative splicing here, one option is to have 1, 2, 3, 5. Another option is to have 1, 2, 4, 5. So this can happen, and you can get multiple combinations from one DNA or primary transcript. It's estimated that 75 to 100 percent of human genes with multiple exons probably undergo alternative splicing. This is one of the reasons why we have actually come to realize humans don't have nearly as many genes as we thought. Our original estimate was 100,000 genes. Right now our estimate is that we have about 10,000 genes. We can regulate things through mRNA degradation. So how long the lifespan of the mRNA in the cytoplasm is helps to determine the pattern of protein synthesis, how much of it you make based on how long you keep the instructions around. Initiation of translation. You can block the initiation of translation with regulatory proteins. And then protein processing and degradation. Several proteins are going to be chemically modified to make them functional. The length of time the protein functions in the cell then can be regulated by selective degradation. How long are you going to keep it around? The proteasomes is a protein complex that recognizes ubiquitin-tagged proteins and then will degrade them. Mutation in this can make the specific cell cycle proteins impervious to proteasome degradation. If the cell isn't breaking down when it's supposed to, or these proteins aren't working for a breakdown, this can lead to cancer where you have the cell growing out of control. Non-coding RNAs can play roles in controlling the gene expression. When we sequenced the human genome, it revealed that only 1.5% of the human in genome is actually protein-coding DNA. The introns are just a fraction of the transcribed, non-translated RNA. There's a significant amount of the genome that may be transcribed into non-coding RNAs, or nCRNAs. So a lot of this genome is actually used for regulation. A couple of these are your microRNAs and small interfering RNAs. MicroRNAs are small single-stranded RNAs. They're capable of binding to complementary sequences in the mRNA. When they do, the degraded target mRNA will break down or it can block translation. 
it's estimated that at least half the genes are regulated by microRNAs. With RNA interference, you inject a double-stranded RNA into the cell to turn off gene expression of a gene with the same sequence as the RNA. Small interfering RNAs, they're similar in size and function to the microRNAs, but they're going to be formed from longer linear double-stranded RNAs. These can interfere with gene expression at stages other than translation. Chromatin remodeling can have an effect on transcription by the non-coding RNAs. Some small RNAs can remodel the chromatin structure. Peewee-associated RNAs, these induce formation of heterochromatin, which blocks the expression of transposons, which are parasitic DNA elements. The evolutionary significance of this is when you can regulate gene expression, it allows a much higher degree of complexity. So this differential gene expression can lead to different cell types in multicellular organisms. This is how you go from being a zygote, which is just a single-celled sperm and egg, into a multicellular organism with very specialized different cells throughout your body. Differentiation is the process by which the cells become specialized in structure and function. Morphogenesis is the creation of form. Here is where cells are going to become organized into tissues and organs. So to do all of this, there are going to be materials placed in the egg by the mother. And this will set up a sequential program of gene regulation that gets carried out as the cells divide. So the egg cell is going to have special instructions in there that's going to carry out and give the cell the plan of how to become specialized. This happens a lot using cytoplasmic determinants. There are substances in the egg that it will influence the course of early development. Induction, this is growth factors and signals from neighboring cells that will cause a change in target cells. So part of it is going to be from the environment, Part of it is going to be within the egg itself that's going to help to create the specialization of the multicellular organism. Determination, these are the events that lead up to the observable differentiation of a cell. These are irreversible. Tissue-specific proteins are found only in a specific type and give the cell its characteristic structure and function. With pattern formation, you have the cytoplasmic determinants and inductive signals contribute to the spatial organization in which the tissues and organs are in their characteristic places. This is going to be why we can all have our eyes, nose, mouth, ears, arms, legs, all in the same place. These cues will tell its location relative to the body axes and the neighboring cells. So this way you can have the cells and their progeny respond to future molecular signals and you can end up with all humans having relatively similar body layouts. Homeotic genes are going to be ones that direct pattern formation and developmental processes in the embryo. Some of them are considered embryonic lethals where they'll have mutations with phenotypes that are too far gone to survive. These will cause death at the embryonic or larval stage and these individuals never go on to reproduce. Basically here the cell looks at it and says this is not going to work. There's nothing we can do to fix it. We're going to scrap it. So to determine the axis you have the maternal effect gene and the egg polarity genes. With the maternal effect gene this is a gene that when it's mutant in the mother it will result in a mutant phenotype in the offspring, regardless of what the offspring's own genotype is. So the offspring can have perfectly fine genes, but if there is a mutation in the mother, it will lead to a mutation in the offspring. Your egg polarity gene, this is going to control the orientation of the polarity of the egg. And consequently, the organism will have its orientation determined here. This was studied in flies, so common examples use the flies. 
their maternal effect genes, and these get set up by having it's going to set up your anterior and posterior axis. So an example of one of these morphogens, these are substances that will establish, establish the embryo's axis and other features of its form are going to be the bicoid proteins and morphogens. Bicoid means two-tailed, and it's going to be a gene for determining the anterior and posterior ends of the body. This cell cycle is pretty important. Cancer is a result from genetic changes, many that will end up affecting cell cycle control. The types of genes associated with cancer are your oncogenes. They're considered cancer-causing genes. Your normal versions of these are going to be proto-oncogenes. These are going to be cellular genes that recode proteins that stimulate normal cell growth and division. There's three categories of changes that will convert a proto-oncogene into an oncogene. One way this can happen is moving DNA within the genome. You can amplify a proto-oncogene, or you can have point mutations in the control element. All of these are changing the way that gene is set up. What we find in cancer cells is that they often have chromosomes that have been broken and rejoined incorrectly with translocated elements. So they break and the cell just tries to put it back together as quickly as it can and it's put back together wrong. Tumor suppressor genes are going to be genes that have products that inhibit cell division. These proteins that they encode are going to help prevent the cell cycle from going out of control through various functions. So if you have a mutation in this, it can certainly contribute to cancer. There are some genes that we have studied quite a bit that have to do with cancer. The Ross gene was named for rat sarcoma. This is mutated in about 30% of human cancers. So the Ross protein is a G protein that's going to relay a signal from a growth factor receptor on the plasma membrane to that cascade of protein kinases. If you remember the G protein receptor is one of those receptors that was used in cell-to-cell -cell communication. The P53 gene is a 53,000 Dalton protein that's made from this tumor suppressor gene. This encodes for a specific transcription factor that promotes synthesis of cell cycle inhibition proteins. So these proteins are important because they are going to shut down the cell cycle. Mutations in over in this gene are found in over 50% of human cancers. This P53 protein functions as an activator for several other genes, including DNA repair. So if P53 goes wrong, it opens the door for many other genes to be out of control. We have a multi-step model of cancer development. There is more than one somatic mutation that's generally needed to produce all the changes that are characteristic of cancer. Cancer doesn't happen from just one mutation in most cases. This is why we see cancer incidence increase with age. Somebody who is genetically predisposed is by having an oncogene or a mutant allele of a tumor suppressor gene is pretty much just one step closer to accumulating the necessary mutations for cancer. It doesn't mean they absolutely will have cancer. When we look at the breast cancer genes, you've got the breast cancer 1 allele. It has a 60% probability of developing breast cancer before age 50 compared to only 2% in the normal allele. When they're looking at do you have a genetic risk for cancer, what they're usually looking at is the women who had cancer before age 50. Both the breast cancer 1 and breast cancer 2 are tumor suppressor genes, so the wild type protects against cancer. They function in repairing DNA damage. If you have the breast cancer gene, what it comes out to is you've got about a 20% greater risk of breast cancer or ovarian cancer than a woman who does not have the breast cancer gene. So there is still a risk of breast cancer that is fairly high in women that don't have the breast cancer gene. The breast cancer gene just increases the risk a little bit more. The risk of cancer is lowered by minimizing your exposure to DNA damaging agents. Some of these things are easier than others to do. Tumor viruses can cause cancer in various animals. They interfere with gene regulation. Viruses seem to play a role in about 15% of human cancers. 
One example is EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus. This is the one for infectious mono. It's linked to multiple cancers, including Burkitt's lymphoma, and that one has a pretty high prevalence in the population. HPV, this is the one that leads to cervical cancer. But before vaccination, it was estimated that about 90% of people had this. So it was pretty prevalent. They are vaccinating. There is a population that was too old to ever receive the vaccine. The vaccine was studied on people up to age 26, so if you were over 26 when the vaccine came out, you weren't able to get vaccinated for it. But in the younger population, we're hoping that it will decrease the risk of cervical cancer. It also increases the risk of penile cancer, anal cancer, throat cancer, any place where the virus comes into contact. So they are starting to vaccinate young boys for this as well. HTLV-1, this is a virus that is going to increase the risk of adult leukemia.